All right. Well, we don't have any attendees quite yet. I don't know if, you know what, I'm gonna pause the recording. All right, here we are. Welcome to the Black Girl Hockey Club boarding school webinar. Uh, my name is Renee Hess. I'm the founder and executive director of BGHC. And tonight we're here to talk about boarding schools, how to get into boarding schools, how to acclimate to the boarding school environment, uh, what the admission process is, what the culture is on campus, and what parents and students should be asking if they're interested in getting their little hockey player into a boarding academy. And so let me introduce to you our panelists today. We've got um, Coach Mike Watson. He is the president and board chair of Columbus Ice Hockey. Uh, he has been a Black Girl Hockey Club volunteer for ages and ages and uh, is our dear co-conspirator from Columbus. How are you doing, Coach Mike? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. I know you have two sons in boarding school or one in boarding school and one at Dartmouth. So we're gonna yeah. talk about what that was like. Uh, and I'm excited to get started in just a second. We also have Miss Nikki Chambers who serves as the Dean of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Belonging at Williston Northampton School. Uh, she and I just met last week, uh, but I'm so glad that we did because uh, the conversation that we had earlier today has been rich and I'm excited to, to share her insights. Nikki, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, everyone. So excited to have a Black woman who is working at a hockey boarding school representing uh, and sharing your experiences. We're going to have a great conversation. And Lisa, hi, Lisa. It's so good to see you. Lisa is the girls hockey head coach and assistant director of admissions at Berkshire School. Uh, Lisa and I started plotting this event uh, a few months ago. And it really coincided with conversations that I had been having with Coach Mike and uh, adding Miss Chambers to the conversation was just a no brainer. Lisa, thank you so much for coming here tonight to talk with our BGHC fam and for helping initiate these conversations. Well, thank you so much for having me and excited to connect with you all. Yes, we're gonna have such a good conversation tonight. Uh, please use the Q&A. Uh, option, we want you to ask questions. This is our second session of the night and the first session was great. We had some great um, participation from our students and our parents who are watching. So please feel free to ask whatever comes to your mind uh, and we'll tr do our best to answer it. Also, if you are looking for more information, you can go to our event Eventbrite uh, online event page. I'm going to put the link in the chat in just a moment. And you can download a handout with some cool information, uh, some contact info as well if you want to get in touch with uh, Miss Marshall and Miss Chambers and Coach Mike after. Uh, if you're looking to learn more about the schools that they're talking about, or you just want to ask some very specific questions about uh, the boarding school process, this is what we're doing. This is why we're here. You can reach out to them. You can reach out to me. We're here to help because we know that this process is complicated. There's not a lot of information out there uh, that you might have access to, but that's what we're here for. So I'm gonna stop talking, turn my camera off and hand it over to the fearsome threesome. Thank you, Renee. Um, I think we started the last call just with like, what is boarding school? Um, and we all kind of have our own rendition of what this weird but wonderful world is. Um, and to, to say it succinctly, it really is a lifestyle. 
where um, you know, you're, you're leaving home or your current school um, typically to board. Um, there are some day options, but usually you're boarding away from your family and um, living at school with like-minded peers. And it really shrinks everything up where you're um, walking to like the rink and um, you know, walking to classes and things like that. And then obviously like living in a dorm. Um, so it's a weird but super cool world. Um, and it's kind of a hidden gem that not everyone knows about, but if you have a peek under the cover, it's, it's certainly special. I think the only thing that I would add to that wonderful and very succinct definition of what boarding school is, um, is that it is a place where students really get to figure out who they are, what they're interested in, um, why they're interested in that thing, um, and where they're able to balance, um, you know, both academic rigor, intellectual risk taking with a pursuit of athletic um, scholarship, right? And so that balance of being a scholar athlete is, I think, particularly unique to boarding schools because you're in an environment where your time is so very structured that you definitely have ample space and ability um, to pursue both academic scholarship and your athletic pursuits. You know, Lisa, Nikki, I think you, you both hit the nail on the head, you know, and as a parent, having two kids that have kind of gone through that boarding school environment, you know, it, it is everything that you just described. It is its own unique kind of place, you know, where kids can excel, where kids can actually get immersed in the things that they're interested in at a very detailed level. So by the time that they leave boarding school, they'll know, like, do I want to do this or do I not want to do this? Right. And so, you know, and that's why I love the boarding school environment, because it kind of accelerates certain aspects of their their maturity and, and, and as they mature. And so, you know, so for me, you know, it, it's been just a, a really good experience to see my kids go through you know, boarding school, you know, there's, there's things that, you know, it's, there's things that are very similar to the high schools that are in the communities, but there's also things that are very different about the boarding school experience that really, I think, you know, deepen um, the experiences that these kids have, you know, especially, you know, for 13 and 14 year olds, 15 year olds that choose to go down this path. To provide a little context until we get the questions rolling in, um, I just wanted to come from like how I learned about boarding school of um, I am originally from Virginia uh, and there weren't there weren't a lot of girls playing. Um, and so it was certainly something that I had a coach that was recognizing the sacrifices my family was making um, and the drive uh, to practice up to Maryland, things like that. Um, and then he said, hey, I know this school that needs a goalie. Why don't you? check it out. Um, and so I was like, okay, great. I'll, uh, I'll go and I'll look. And if I get in, um, then I guess I'll go. And, and we were very nonchalant and like very uninformed about the process. Um, and so I just wanted to, to come here today and sort of share um, just the opportunity that exists. Uh, so for example, there are a couple of different branches of like NEPSAC. Oh, yep. How can school, there it is, NEPSAC of the New England Prep School um, Sports Athletic Conference. Um, so that's kind of one branch. And then another is more of like the Hockey Academy. Um, and so Berkshire is uh, a NEPSAC, so is Williston, and then Culver is an independent, um, which is kind of like a happy medium between the two, I suppose. Um, and so a lot of the NEPSAC are in the New England area. Um, and they kind of operate on a model of fall, winter, spring, where hockey is 100% in the winter. However, you can skate in the fall and things like that, too. Um, and so that's kind of a brief overview that we accidentally got into. Um, but Nikki, Mike, I'll toss it to you. Yeah, you know, I'll jump in and kind of talk about, you know, Culver and the independent boarding school and kind of what that means. What that means pretty much is that, you know, there probably aren't more boarding schools around you. So you kind of have this hybrid experience where, 
you know, whereas with the NEPSAC, you know, the boarding schools pretty much play athletic, athletic events and do things just amongst each other. The independent boarding schools don't have that. So the Culver experience will be this mix of competing against uh, local high school teams in some sports, but then, you know, you might travel and compete against other prep schools, other, you know, high level teams as well. So when I think about like a hockey program, they, they pretty much align to USA Hockey Tier 1, you know, for, for our top team. So, you know, they'll eat, so they play boarding schools from the NEPSAC. They play some of the boarding schools in Canada. And then they play some of the top USA Hockey Tier 1 teams too as well. But Culver also has hockey teams that just play the top high school teams around the country too as well. And, and I think that that's something, you know, the really – consider when you're thinking about these prep in these in these boarding schools is that you know they do offer levels of competition and experiences to play against kids that you otherwise would not have the opportunity to play against had you not gone there and I just wanted to make a shameless plug that Williston was the NEPSAC champion last year for girls ice hockey. So um, <laughs> our model is very, very similar to Berkshire um, in the sense that you are playing ice hockey 100% of the time in the winter. Um, but that also means that that frees up our students, I think, to pursue other interests. So like if you're an ice hockey player that also wants to participate in the fall play, you have that ability to kind of be that artist and be that ice hockey player. So I think that's something that's really unique about being in a boarding school. Um, and I think that kind of leads into our question here about the culture of boarding schools, right? And I think that the types of students that go to boarding schools are students that are eager and excited to kind of forge their own independence um, because you're not gonna be home where your parents are waking you up at 7 a.m. And I remember my mom like banging on my door, like, let's go, you gotta go to school. So that's not there. Um, no, you know, there's no parent breathing down your back saying like, you know, have you done this? Have you done that? There's a lot of independence there. Um, and that's also because boarding schools have ample support. So while it might not be your mom, your dad, or, or any loved one telling you like, you know, when to do your homework, there are a host of um, structures and systems in place, like study hall every day of the week, um, having dorm parents that are making sure that you're doing what you need to be doing, having an advisor that's checking on your work and making sure that you feel as if you have an advocate as you're navigating our school. So I would say, you know, that was a long winded way of kind of articulating what types of students go to boarding school. Um, to to kind of jump into a little bit more that I don't know if we talked about this the last time, um, but boarding school kind of what Nikki was leading to of like it's a it's an an empowering um, kind of experience for the student to really take uh, like just take like take hold of so many different parts of their life, um, especially academically. Um, so oftentimes. Usually these schools have like class sizes of like 10 to 12 kids um, in a class, which is typically a lot smaller, especially smaller than the public school that I went to before I went to boarding school. Um, and so, for example, you know, if if you go into an English uh, class and it's discussion based and you didn't do your homework, it doesn't take the class long to, to realize that you can't really contribute that day because you didn't do your homework. So it, it really puts a lot of onus back on the student. Um, so that's, it, it's, it's like a very, um, I don't know, it just aligns kids with what they want um, and what they want for themselves in the future too. Yeah, and we talked about this in the last session, but I would be remiss if we didn't, just making that connection, Lisa, right? Like, these are skills that students who are, who may have gone to day schools, um, when you go to college, they're learning all of those things that our boarding populations have had to do on their own for, you know, four years. So, you know, there's the acclimation period when you move on to the next steps in your educational journey you've kind of really worked out a lot of those things. You know whether or not you're a morning person or a night owl, right? So you know what time is best for you to do your homework. Our students are so good at finding time to do things, right? There are only 24 hours in a day. We're not getting any more. But our kids know, oh, I have a free period, you know, between, you know, 10, uh, between 11 a.m. and noon. 
instead of going back to my dorm room to sleep, which some of our kids do, um, they also may use that time more wisely and go to the library and knock out some homework, right? So you're getting things done during the day as opposed to waiting um, until like the night to do your work. So our kids are incredibly savvy at working smarter, not harder, learning how to make friends and build community, learning how to, you know, take yourself out of your comfort zone and try things that they've never tried before. Um, and so all of those things that, you know, most students learn when they're freshmen or sophomore in college, our students leave our, our doors with those skills, well-equipped to acclimate and find great success in college. Yeah, and, and, and I can speak to that because having one that just transitioned, you know, a year ago, you know, his ability to acclimate, his ability to seek out help, you know, from his professors, from the services that the university offered, his ability to find a friend group, his ability to get involved in clubs. Those are all things that he learned in the boarding school environment, right? And, and, and the greatest thing about the boarding school environment, and, and Nikki and Lisa, we talked about this a little in the first session, was it, it's a very forgiving environment because it's, it's encouraging kids to step outside of their comfort zones, right? So when, so when, so when they go to that next level, right, they already know how to advocate for themselves. They already know how to spend their free time. You know, they already know, you know, when they need to study versus not, you know, and so, and all those things are really important. And I'll tell you as a parent, when you drop them off at college, you're prepared for that too as well. Right. So and, and what you do is you kind of have an outer body experience because you've already been doing it for four years. And so you kind of look at people and like, whoa, why are we crying or why do we got so much luggage? Why do we have so much furniture? They really don't need all that. Right. But those are the, those, you know, you go on this same journey with your child, too, as well. And that's one of the things I definitely didn't bring up in the first session, you know, is talking about that. You know, just because your kids in boarding school, it doesn't mean the parenting stops you know, you evolve with your student too as well because you're learning, you know, kind of how to help them be successful and what is the new normal for the whole family. I noticed that we have um, a question in the chat. Um, what does the admissions process look like from start to finish? Um, and then there are a couple of follow-ups here. Um, how many hockey student athletes are accepted each year for boarding school? And how do you determine which uh, student athlete would be the best fit for your best fit for your particular program? Okay, I'll I'll talk I'll tackle this one. Whew. All right. So at boarding school, you wear a lot of hats. Um, I am actually zooming in from a dorm. I live in a dorm. Um, so that's one of my hats. I'm a dorm head. And then I also am the girls hockey coach. And then I also work in admissions. That's my day job. Um, but essentially, so what admissions looks like is during um, the year preceding when you would like to look at boarding school. So for example, if you're currently in eighth grade and you're looking to hopefully check out the process as a ninth grader, um, what you would then do is during the fall and the winter, you'd go and you'd set up visits um, with these different schools. Um, and so I don't know if I said this before, but like for NEPSAC, there are 53 different schools that offer girls hockey. Um, so the, it, there's so much opportunity out there. Um, and so you'd go kind of create a list and then reach out to these schools, set up a visit. A typical visit would be about two hours where the first hour is you'll have a, a student led tour of campus. And then you'd come back and have an interview. And so that interview would uh, often, like this is typical for most of the New England schools, is that first the student would speak with an admission officer and then you switch and they'd speak with just the parents or guardians. Um, and so that's kind of uh, the admissions interview and that's one part of the application. So then from there, all, all of the application would be due January 15th um, and then uh, the school, the committee will break down all the applications and that will be um, March 10th is when schools release decisions and then April 10th is when families have to decide uh, what their next move is as a family. Um, and then as a caveat, we did have a question about financial aid in there too. 
Um, and so that's a great question to ask every single school and every school is going to have um, like a different answer um, where depending on how much financial aid they have per year. Um, we like, for example, at Berkshire, we try to read need blind as long as possible until we actually it's, it's a finite resource. Um, and so essentially, once uh, we get to the point of the process, um, there's only so much money, but that's really what we try to do um, is to read need blind. There are some schools that are super fortunate. They can read need blind all the way. Um, but those are usually the much bigger schools with very, very large endowments. You know, the, the thing I will say, particularly as a parent who's gone through the boarding school financial aid process is, um, you know, be very transparent about it. You know, I've had conversation with parents who were like, they were embarrassed to kind of put some bills that they had. And, and then they're like, well, I didn't, I didn't get the, the financial aid that I, I thought I was going to get, right? And it's like, well, if you don't kind of show the true financial picture, right, then it's very hard to kind of have this, it's very hard to treat you fairly through the process. That's the first thing. The second thing is, you know, if you're really passionate about the school, you know, you know, there's, there's a process where the school says, okay, here's kind of what your financial aid is, but there's also an appeals process that you could go through too as well. And, and depending on, you know, the, the extra documentation that is submitted, you know, the school might make an additional adjustment in the financial aid uh, too as well, right? So it's not, I don't want people to think these financial aid decisions are first time final. You know, there, there is an appeals process that you can go through. But I always tell people, if you're transparent up front, then you have a starting point, right? But nothing, I bet Lisa and Nikki, nothing's more frustrating than to go through an appeals process and somebody's like, oh yeah, there's this bill that I have. And you're like, well, why wasn't it put on the FAFSA, right? And so, so that's the one thing that I say, you know, if your child is that important to you as all of our children are, you know, this is something that you really need to do, you know, for your child is be transparent, you know, when you fill out the financial aid forms. I will also add um, to Lisa's point also, which kind of bridges what Mike just said, right? We're working with financial aid and it is a finite resource. So being transparent up front when you're looking at the whole bucket of financial aid money is way better than waiting until the appeals process when much of that financial aid has already been allocated. Um, so being transparent at the beginning when schools are working with a larger number of financial aid to disseminate will be better off in the long run than waiting um, for the appeals process to kind of share um, your additional financial burdens with an admissions office. Can I ask uh, both of you ladies a question about financial aid? Because I know, you know, how is that process? Is it is it every year you have to submit financial aid? Are, the award, are there four-year awards? Do you see from your experience the awards changing drastically based on academic performance or athletic performance? Or, or is it like, no, it's really pretty much based on kind of family income, you know, so can we kind of have a little discussion on that? Nikki, do you want to start or do you want me to start? Go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> so there certainly, um, I would say that uh, once, like say uh, your student applies for ninth grade and they get a certain number, um, that's not going to change drastically of, you know, it won't be from nine to 10, all of a sudden you have to pay 30,000 more dollars. Um, there's typically a very strong commitment to the family of, okay, if this is what our first read was, unless of course you win the lottery or something like substantial. Um, but that also includes if it goes the other way, um, you know, for example, during COVID and things like that, there were families that, you know, that certainly struggled. Um, and so we did our best as, a, as an institution to meet our current families where they were um, and to ensure that their, their children were enrolled at the school. So, um, you know, I think once that number is aligned, like it's consistent throughout the time uh, at Berkshire or at most boarding schools. Yeah, our model is very similar. Yeah. And, and, the, and the one thing that, that, I'll, that I'll say, like with my experience, when I was going through the financial aid process and, 
And, you know, and it's funny, you know, my kids are in public school, so I was used to paying nothing for education, right? So I had to kind of recalibrate myself, right? Because even though I was paying nothing for education, I was paying a whole lot to play AAA hockey, right? Mm. And so, you know, when, when the school first came, it was like, here's how much I think, you know, you can, you can pay. I was like, whoa, I thought, you know, whoa. Because, but then when I thought about just how much I was spending on hockey, how much I was spending on travel, and then I started to tick off how I wouldn't have to do some of those things, right? Then all of a sudden it was like, well, for this price, I get hockey and I get an education. It was, it was worth the trade-off. And particularly from a hockey perspective, like I was one of those guys, I did the calculation, like how much ice time would I get if they went to Culver versus how much ice time I would get with my program. And what I found was, from the ice time and the experience and everything else that they were having, I was actually getting three seasons worth of ice time in one season. So my cost to play AAA hockey wasn't one to one. It was like, hey, take that cost, times it by three, and that's the real value. And so at that point, it was like, whoa, this is a great opportunity for, for my kid because now you get first class education first class hockey, first class coaches, first class facilities, it made it all worth it. So, okay, here, here's, a, here's a good question. How do facilities at boarding schools, especially for hockey? The, the facilities are very, very nice. Um, and every school has their own personality and their own facilities, but overwhelmingly, I feel confident saying that boarding school facilities are um, in more, like, for example, our rink at Berkshire is better than any college rink that I called home, um, and so that's a big part of my coaching philosophy is is making sure that our kids are grateful um, for what they have. Um, they respect the space and the locker room is spotless um, because we are so very fortunate for the facilities that we have here. I would say the exact same of, of Williston that we have a great hockey rink. Um, and we also are very um, clear with students about not only how the skaters use the rink and the ice hockey players, but also how our spectators engage in the sport as well. Um, because ice hockey is a very popular sport in the wintertime at Williston and our, our students love to watch um, the girls ice hockey team play um, because they're just such a phenomenal team. Um, and even um, beyond athletics, we have amazing learning spaces for students. We have maker spaces for kids who may want to engage in 3D work. We have um, great classrooms that are small and intimate, yet dynamic with um, huge amounts of technology. I'm sure this is very true for Berkshire, but at Williston, every student gets a surface before they start. So all of our technology is exactly the same. Um, and so our, we're very integrated in that way when it comes to learning. Um, every student gets the same surface, so they're all working off, and so does the faculty. So everybody's kind of working off of the same system. And I think when you go to boarding school, as Mike was saying, you know, this is what you're paying for, that investment in having technology integrated into your education system. Um, you're paying for those smaller classes, so you get that individualized attention. Um, and so when your student is struggling academically, um, you know, there's somebody who's always paying attention to the grades that students are getting to kind of pull them aside lovingly like why didn't you turn in that chemistry assignment I just did that to a student last week that's why that's my example um and they'll tell me oh well you know I did it I just didn't hit submit and I'll just be like well pull out your computer and I will sit here until you hit submit um and so it's that level of care that you're also getting that kind of I think extends beyond these like beautiful um amenities that our students have access to there's a level of care embedded in that as well All right, so Lisa, here's a question for you. Um, and it delves into, and the reason why, at least I wanna throw it to you first, because it delves into how you build your team, right? And so, you know, I think it delves into a little bit about recruiting, a little bit about the admission process, and then a little bit about, you know, kind of, you know, how you, you, know, how you balance that, right? So let's, let's take the first part of the question 
because then then for the second part of the question, I think Rebecca Warner's on the line, Lincoln Brown's mom. And I think we can pull her in and she can talk through the process her family went through to pick the best program for Lincoln. So Rebecca, if you're out there, you'd be thinking about the answer to the question, but Lisa, I'll let you take the first part. Sure. So how many student athletes are accepted each year for boarding school? Um, I think that that is, um, it, I mean, as a varsity head coach, I know what I need, like what I'm graduating. And so that's going to change every year. Um, but also I want to kind of zoom out a little bit um, where like I'm the girls varsity head coach at Berkshire. There are lots of other sports. Um, and then also like even from a hockey standpoint, we have varsity, JV and thirds on both the boys and girls side. So um, there's a lot of hockey to be played at boarding school. Um, but I think that like each year it is quite competitive um, to be recruited as a varsity athlete with any of the sports. Um, but as long as you're putting your best self forward and, um, and aiming to be a good person as well as a good hockey player, then, um, you know, I think that's, there's, there are plenty of schools out there. You know, and I think Lisa and Nikki, one of the things, you know, that we don't talk about with the board of schools sometimes is, is how, you can develop. So you, you, you're you not playing on the top team coming in. That happened to my son. He didn't play on the top team coming in. He wasn't one of those athletes, right, who came in, immediately put on the varsity squad. But because of the quality coaching in the program, the number of teams, he was able to work to evolve his game where he did make the top team, you know, after being at school, you know, to three you know for two three years and I think that's something else you know for people I understand like if you have a child that's on the cusp right the boarding school environment might be the place to just open them up and help them get better as a player as a student so that they can realize their dreams too as well all right Nikki here's a question for you and then you know how can how can black students acclimate to attending a predominantly white institution like like a boarding school and, and not only black students I think women you know people you know in diverse and people from diverse backgrounds too as well. Yeah, absolutely. I love this question um, because I think it's one of those questions that's an invitation to be really honest. And I think if anything, as families are navigating this boarding school process, this is an opportunity to be transparent with yourselves and with your and with your students about what you're looking for in an institution. Um, is boarding school the right decision for you and your family? So I think this whole journey is an invitation to honesty. So I see this question as an opportunity to do just that. Um, and I think, you know, boarding schools, frankly, like we are works in progress. We, I'm very open about that when I talk to families of color, um, families from diverse backgrounds, um, black families. Um, I am very, very clear that we are works in progress. We are predominantly white institutions. For context, Williston was founded in 1841. Um, for US history buffs in the room, I mean, there were a lot of things that were happening in 1841 that, are, that would not be happening today. And that is the history with which our schools are founded on. So we have work to do, but I think what we are doing is we are really committed to doing the important work of you know, actualizing anti-racism, um, anti-bias, anti-discrimination in our communities. Um, at um, And depending upon who you are, I don't wanna paint Black students as a monolith. Um, so I think it's also good for students to know what they need in order to find community. Um, for example, I know that many boarding schools, I know Berkshire, I know Williston, we have a host of affinity groups. And as the um, affinity group leader for our Black Student Union, our Black Student Union is like a family. And we always tell them like, you know, you can have issues with people outside of this group, but the minute you step into this group, we are a family. Um, and our kids really do carry that sentiment. Um, and they really find ways to lift each other up, um, to really find connection that, you know, they come together, they speak up, they have critical conversations that are absolutely necessary and important for their growth of um, not just black students, but all students at Williston, um, because actualizing anti-racism is for everybody. Um, 
And so I think for students who need, you know, who want affinity spaces as an opportunity to build community, that is absolutely there. Um, and there are also spaces for students to build community who aren't interested in joining affinity groups, whether that's, you know, finding a club to join that's aligned with your values, your passions, your interests. Um, the beautiful thing about boarding school is that time is so structured. So just as there's time for practice from 345 to 545, there is also time for students to participate in clubs and organizations. And so you can be the ice hockey player and then also go, you know, join the Dungeons and Dragons club if that's what you want to do. Um, so there are so many different ways that students can acclimate to a PWI. Um, but I also think that it is such a powerful lesson in learning how to advocate for yourself and for your needs. Um, and that there's a whole host of support um, as you do that. And I think for families who are looking at boarding schools, asking admission officers, um, how many faculty of color do you have on campus? Um, what are your goals? Do you plan on diversifying your faculty? What are your, you know, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion goals? Um, so many schools in the wake of the murder of George Floyd really stepped up and named very loudly and very publicly what their goals are as it comes to actualizing diversity, equity, and inclusion in, in their boarding school environment. So feel free to ask um, and making sure that those answers make you feel comfortable enough to send your child there because you know they're going to be cared for. Um, I mean, owning that I'm a white woman who is in this conversation and, and on a boarding school campus as an ally to, to any student who is here, my number one goal of being at this community is to make sure that every student feels safe um, and that they feel that they can be their full selves as soon as they get to the driveway, that they don't have to leave any part of themselves at the end of the driveway. Um, and of course, certain students, you know, like it's going to take some time to really feel comfortable. And, and um, as Nikki was mentioning, maybe there's an affinity space or maybe there's a new opportunity that they'd like to try. Um, I smiled at one point because I was just asked when Nikki was talking about clubs, I was just asked by two students who live in my dorm because I love the dorm feed that we do at Berkshire. Um, and they were like, can you be our faculty advisor for the African cooking club? And so I'm like looking up all of these recipes for like fufu. I'm going to try. We have no idea. But it's just been like one of these really remarkable things of like, even if you don't know necessarily, there are so many people who are just excited to share who they are and where they come from, from all around the world, from all different backgrounds. Um, and it's okay to just kind of lean in and try something new. Cool, you, that, such a robust answer. I don't think there's anything more that I could add to that, but I see we have Rebecca, Rebecca join us. So Rebecca, Lincoln, you know, first year at Culver Military Academy playing on their U19, the top girls team. One of the things that I wanted you to kind of take the folks on the call through a little bit is, you're the process that your family went through to find the right boarding school for Lincoln. So if you can kind of give us some insight as to what was important to you, what questions you asked, what were some of the red flags where you guys immediately were like, no, we're not going there. And then what were some of the green flags where it was like, oh, you know what, we need to, we need a little bit more information on this. So I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to you. Um, hi, Mike. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess I'll start from the beginning. Um, we were, we didn't have any information about boarding schools. We had no idea. Um, Lincoln was playing here in California and um, some schools saw her play and would talk to our coach, but um, none of that information was, um, you know, carried on to us. So we went um, into this not knowing anything. And thank goodness for Renee and the Blacker Hockey Club um, and you, Mike, for helping us um, with this journey. Um, Lincoln started looking into boarding schools when um, you know we we realized that um, the level of play she needed uh, wasn't necessarily um, here in California. She needed a higher level, so um, she started by looking 
at the hockey rankings of the schools, of course, that was her, um, you know, her, her main concern. Uh, but I also wanted academics. So um, we, you know, compared some schools. Um, I, I, the academics are important to me, the hockey was important to Lincoln, and also, you know, there's the financial aspect. Um, so um, we asked so many questions, um, and, and, and some of the things that it came down to were, where was she going to get the most ice time? Um, where were um, girls going after they graduated? Um, you know, what colleges were they getting into? And, um, you know, the education, I, I wanted her to, to get a good education. Um, and we applied to a few schools. Um, you know, she wrote the essays and applied for financial aid. Um, you know, I agree with you, Mike, you have to be, um, not embarrassed to tell, you know, what, what realistically you can af afford, um, even, you know, um, and the, and schools were really great working with us on that. Um, so it was kind of a balance. Where was she going to get the best education? Where was she going to get the best ice time and what could we afford? And, um, we met the coaches and she found the coach that she really liked um, and chose Culver. And we're, and we're happy to have her. <laughs> I will say that for sure. You know, Rebecca, thank, thank you for sharing because I, I think, you know, for parents to hear the process because our process was really similar, you know, academics were important, you know, quality hockey and coaching were important, particularly, you know, I think about my sons who still, who still needed some development, right? So it's like, hey, where are they going to get that best opportunity to develop and then reap the benefits of that development? So Lisa, I do have a question for you. Um, you know, here, a lot of people, you know, Rebecca talked about it with Lincoln, you know, she went, she went to a tournament, she was noticed, and then the process kind of got started from there. Can you, help you know these students you know understand like hey what is that ideal process to get noticed is it playing on the summer teams is it playing you know on a top girls team and going to the right tournament you know and if it is about the tournaments what tournament should they be going to and if they're not you know can you really kind of like uh you know really pull back the covers on that whole process for how someone could get noticed you know by a prep school Absolutely. So even um, even with like certainly there are um, a lot of different showcases where you can enter as an individual in the summertime um, and even in like late spring that are like prep. Like if you're interested in prep school, you can go to these showcases um, and, it, and it'll all um, like nearly every prep school that has girls hockey will be represented throughout the weekend. Um, but then even before that, you can um, you can just create uh, like the outreach and the advocacy is the biggest part. Like if you know you want to do this, you've got to take control of, of the um, process and like really look up um, coaches contacts on on uh, e or sorry, on websites and things like that write emails and like share video, you know, if you're out on the West coast and, and most of the uh, new England boarding schools are in new England, then, you know, just create um, a video or, you know, even something on Instagram. Like I know that there are some programs um, that are out on the West coast who have awesome Instagram accounts. And that alone has, you know, brought a few players um, into, into boarding schools uh, kind of scope. Um, so certainly anything like that, uh, reaching out, advocating for yourself, and expressing interest, um, it goes a long way. All right, so Nikki, I got, I got a question coming your way. So what, what are the academic expectations for admissions? Standardized testing, you know, I think that's a you know, that's a big hot point as of late, you know, so, and particularly, you know, for some schools, it's the SSAT and, and you know, people don't know, like, kind of how the scoring works and things like that. So can you, you know, you and Lisa both kind of 
you know, kind of demystify some of that for us? Mm -hmm. I hate to kick the can down the road, but seeing as I do diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work, um, I'm probably not the expert on admissions yeah. here on the panel. So I am going to ask so Lisa good. if she doesn't mind um, kind of answering that question, because I think she'll provide much better guidance than I. Yeah. Okay, so you guys are, are, are tuning into prep school at an interesting time because right uh, during COVID, um, SSAT was the standard test um, that most schools required, but then once COVID hit, a lot of schools have moved to test optional, um, and you're seeing that in higher ed too. Um, and then that kind of challenged a lot of schools, especially like for example, well, yeah, so it challenged a lot of schools of like, what's the importance of this one time test score? Um, so some schools are still sticking to like a benchmark approach where unless you've hit a certain percentile um, on the testing, you're not really in their eyes an eligible applicant, but then other places, um, you know, if, if you didn't do that well on the test, then you don't even need to submit the scores. Instead, you can just submit, like sometimes it's a written piece of work or sometimes it's additional, um, like an additional recommendation. Um, so that's certainly like a nuanced answer uh, that it sort of seems like I kicked the can a little too, but it's not a one size answer for all of these schools. You've got to ask each specific application um, requirement for all of the schools but it's gaining less in, uh, less weight, if that makes sense. Because it's a tricky test, the SSAT. Cool, so how does the process of recruiting work for international students, especially you know, those from Canada? I mean, uh, we, we certainly have um, quite a few um, especially on the boy side, we have a few Canadians um, from a few different provinces. So really, it's a lot of um, I think a lot of the boys are using agents. Um, but I think that a lot of the girls like all you are a lot of players in Canada and, and internationally, um, as long as you're reaching out and advocating for yourself, that's what gets the ball rolling. Um, and so, you know, reach out and say, hey, can we connect over Zoom? Here's my video from a game or something like that. It doesn't have to be professional quality. I promise if it's just through an iPhone or an iPad or something like that, or even Live Barn, um, if you can send some clips through that um, in, a, in a really awesome way, COVID did kind of make recruiting a lot more accessible for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I can speak from a color perspective. We have quite a few kids from Canada that are part of our teams, right? And at least you hit the nail on the head, you know, the process works the same for them as it, as it works for kids that live in the United States. You know, you reach out, you start the conversation from there, and then, and then you know, hopefully you end up at a school that kind of matches, you know, what you're looking for. So Nikki, question for you. Uh, what do weekends look like for students who don't live close enough to go home? Great question and one I can answer. Um, so I would say one, uh, Saturdays are often game days. Um, so I know that at Williston and I believe Berkshire too, we, at Williston, we have classes every other Saturday. Um, so we have, you guys too? Okay, great. Um, so there's every other week, you're gonna have classes on Saturday morning. Um, but in the afternoon, Saturdays are game days. And depending upon whether your game is home or away, um, you'll be spending your Saturday afternoon at a game. Um, if it happens to be the off season and you're not playing a sport, then maybe you're going down to the field to go cheer your friends on. Uh, but we also have um, our dean's office does a lot of planning um, to make sure that there are weekend activities for our students. Um, we have we'll have movie nights, we'll have dances. Um, we also have trips that will take kids off to the mall. Um, and then we also have something called command van, um, which is one of my favorite weekend activities because you and like maybe five of your friends can be like, I want to go to Chipotle and the command van will literally take you anywhere you want to go. Um, East Hampton um, is really great um, in the sense that um, we're really close to a town. Um, and so like our kids are able to kind of walk into town if they want to go get something, get a bite to eat with their friends. Um, on the weekends, we have hosts of clubs and activities that are meeting and doing things too. Um, so um, that's what we have. Awesome. Mm -hmm. 
So one one of the one of the things you know, and and we talked about this a bit when we were in the last session we were talking about the various affinity groups that are at the school. Because I know Culver's got like a Black Student Union. You know, Nikki, can you dive in a little bit deeper into the types of activities that these affinity groups do? Why they're mm -hmm. so important? Lisa, want to hear you know your thoughts on affinity groups too as well you know, at Berkshire and, and really how the value that they have and, and helping kids acclimate to the boarding school environment. Yeah, um, we have a lot of affinity groups and I, as the person who kind of like manages the affinity groups on campus, I want us to have more. Um, we have we have um, our Black identifying affinity group. We have a Jewish affinity group. We have a Catholic affinity group. We have a neurodivergent affinity group with students for, who have different learning disabil um, disabilities. We have a Latinx club. Um, we have a host of affinity groups on our campus. Um, and I find, I think affinity spaces are so important because they give students an opportunity to connect with other students on campus who they may or may not know identify as sim uh, similarly to them as they just wouldn't know. Um, so affinity groups really give students a place and a space to come together and have conversations um, about how, how they're navigating Williston, how they're navigating Berkshire. Um, and I think that these spaces really provide important community. Um, and I think that's like, what boarding school is. Boarding school is a big community, but in it are smaller communities. Um, and so giving students opportunities to kind of, you know, if you go to BSU, like the Black Student Union, and you're like, this is great, but I'm also, I also identify as multiracial and I want to meet with people who might, you know, might be having similar struggles to me as they, as, you know, as I do you have that space to do that. So I think affinity groups go a long way in providing really important identity-based support for our students. Um, and like I said earlier, affinity groups are not for everyone. And that is not the only way that a black student or a student of color or a Jewish student or a woman um, can find support at our institutions, but it is one of the many ways that we provide it. I think um, to, to kind of add to that as well, or, or kind of, I think one of the really beautiful things that I've been able to witness is that when there's been a void of a student's experience, they're able to advocate, create a group um, that can help not only support them, but other students as well. Um, so whether it is, um, you know, something of uh, a racial affinity or um, it's so cool that you have the neuro, we, we now have like a learning difference, which um, a student left as a legacy, uh, and then even, um, you know, like kids who are going through, like if they're grieving a uh, loss of a loved one, or if they mm. are, um, if they have divorced parents or something like that, like there's, uh, it's really, really exciting to see the next generation learning how to talk about difficult things and, and, and not just talk about it, but to support each other in a way that's like very, um, you know, effective and, and, and just, it's really special to see in my opinion. Um, so yeah. it's cool that boarding schools can create those spaces for kids to help themselves and help each other. Yeah. I think Lisa, your comment made me think, right? Like teenagers are, it's one of the coolest populations to work with, but they're kind of an enigma, right? Because you watch kids really trying to forge their independence and yet they still very much need structure and they need adults and they need guidance. And I think affinity groups really provide students with an opportunity to maybe really think about like, who am I as I relate to this identity? How do other people relate to their identities? And do we all do it in the same way? And the answer is likely no. Um, and so being surrounded by people who share your identity, but maybe show up in the world differently, right? Like I identify as a black woman, but I play ice hockey and you're in a conversation with someone who plays football. And then you're in conversation with someone else who's like, I don't do sports, right? And then you're in a, a conversation with someone who's in the play and is an actress and is a dancer. And so you're coming together based on this one identity, but there are so many other aspects of who you are that you get to come in conversation and just experience the richness um, that is diversity at our schools.
We work in really special places. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies, I, I think uh, we, one last question that we have here and then Renee will turn over to you. Through the ambitious process, Lisa, are there any other considerations that can help an application stand out that can help with, you know, that can help a student like really kind of get over that hump and the boarding school goes, I want that person. You know, what, you know, in your in your time, you know, sitting in admissions, you know, any additional advice for, for the parents on the call? Um, definitely. And this is kind of like a uh, word of word of advice as well as as you're kind of going through this process, check out a ton of like, you know, look out several different schools and find what works best for that, like for your child and, and for the students on the call, like find out what school helps you um, kind of realize who you want to become. And so in order to kind of what's what's really captivating is when you um, you've really connected with a school and you're excited about how it can help you be who you want to become. Um, and so whether it's, you know, academically, athletically, personally, um, it's, it's not just one thing, but you're a whole person. So that's really what the boarding school experience is about. Um, you know, you don't have to just lead with hockey. I would encourage you to, to not, you know, hockey is one part of who you are. Um, but, you know, be sure to, to look at all of the things that you want to build up throughout that experience. Thank you guys. It, this has been such an enriching conversation um, and a little bit different than the one we had of the, in the first session. Uh, so just as an FYI to parents and students watching, we're going to throw these both of these videos up on our YouTube page. Uh, so you can go to Black Girl Hockey Club YouTube page and find it probably tomorrow because it's getting late and we're trying to get some dinner and go to bed, right guys? Uh, you know, I really do appreciate you, Lisa, Nikki, and Mike coming together to talk about your experiences working and putting your kids into boarding school and also to Rebecca Warner, uh, whose daughter Lincoln has uh, been a two-time Black Girl Hockey Club scholarship awardee and is now a, a Culver a Culver Sporting School student. And we're just so super proud of her and the path that she's taken. And so we really appreciate Rebecca coming on and talking a little bit about the process. And also, you know, the three of you, thank you so, so much for answering questions, for being here for our students. Uh, if you missed it, I've put in the chat a link to the Eventbrite online event page. There you can see some videos of the Berkshire girls hockey team. You can get the links to the handout for today's event and also to a slideshow with some information about NEPSAC, which is a term I heard for the first time today. Uh, this has been so informative for me. I hope it has been so as well for the parents and for the students. And let's get some of these kids into boarding school because like I said before, we, we just wanna make sure that they can play hockey as long as they wanna play hockey. Uh, and that's what BGHC is here for. And that's what uh, Lisa, Nikki and Mike are here for as well. If you have any questions on that handout, you can find their contact information. You can reach out to them. That's what we're here for. This is what we're doing this for. And if you can, if you don't wanna reach out to them, you can reach out to me. Uh, my contact info is there as well. Thank you so much for coming, for joining us uh, and, and for sharing your experiences. You guys have a wonderful evening. I'll talk to you soon. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Have a great evening, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you as well. Have a good night.